So um, we are uh, finally up to the, uh, the actual um, final solution here, um, which, uh, <laughs> you know, you wouldn't think people would be expecting for, but here we are. All right. So, all right, look, um, up till 1939, as you said, Hitler, the, the Nazis, they, you know, were talking a lot about getting rid of Jews, but, uh, you know, through emigration and expulsion and whatnot. Um, but every victory, somewhat ironically, brought them a larger Jewish population. Um, you know, so that by the end of 1939, um, they had a far larger Jewish population under the control than they had even in 1933. And the question then becomes, okay, now we are in the situation, we have far more power over the Jews than we had before, but on some level, far less power uh, as far as the larger world, right? Meaning that because the war is going on, um, you know, th that theoretically closes off a, a lot of possibilities or potential poss possibilities in the larger world. Um, and um, the, 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 the thing to keep in mind is that, right, for all that the Jews represented certainly a fairly central element in Nazi thought, um, the Jewish problem was only one of several problems, and especially once the war break breaks out, they have to sort of balance or juggle their concerns about the Jews with other things as well, um, including the question of, of colonization, including the question of expansion, um, including the question of the war effort itself. Um, so, you know, right off the bat, when they take over Poland, um, you know, there is a partition, right? Part of Poland is taken over by the Soviet Union. Um, part of Poland is integrated into the Reich itself. Right, this you know, purplish and various odd things here. Um, uh, and part of Poland is called something called the general government, um, which is to some extent going to be a, a reservation, um, a reservation for Jews, but also a reservation for Poles, right? So, you know, in the Nazi view of things, this area here, the area that's incorporated into the Reich, is to be. Line, right, that is going to be free of Jews, right? That that's a priority of sorts. Um, it's also going to be free of most poles. Um, something less of a priority, and some poles maybe uh, of su suitably, you know, Germanic stock to be allowed to stay. Um, so, uh, you know, there are sort of the immediate concern getting Jews from this area, right, where there are lots of Jews into this area. Um, but also then the question of what do you do with the Jews once they're in this area? And what do you do with all of this while you've got to balance the other concerns of the war effort that goes on, right? Um, and when I say colonization, understand that I mean uh, settling Germans in territories in the East. Okay. Um, ghettoization begins early on, right? So by October, um, the, the ghettoization begins in 1939. Um, and you can look over here, like, there are ultimately maybe 100, 200 something ghettos, um, I think 100 so, uh, in Poland, some in Eastern Europe. And if you look over the ones in Poland, one thing should say, they're, they're mostly in the general government, right? So the, the they're, they're not building ghettos uh, so much in this area here because they're hoping that they won't have to be stockpiling Jews here. Um, there are lots of different types of ghettos. There are, there are ghettos that are walled in and fenced in. There are ghettos that are basically just open areas where they say this is the ghetto, right? It varies widely from place to place. And in, in our view of things, right, looking back, right, hindsight being 20, 20, 20, um, it, it seems pretty clear, oh, right, they're setting up the ghettos in preparation for exterminating the Jews, right? Um, but, but that's not necessarily the case at the time, right? Um, what to what end was this, right? What was the purpose of these ghettos? I mean, for us, easy to say, oh, well, this is a step towards extermination. Um, that was certainly not the way at least some Nazis saw it at the time. Um, there were important figures, people like Adolf Eichmann, who are obviously going to be significant figures in the extermination, who in late 1939, in 1940, are pursuing alternatives. Um, right after France uh, collapses in the... Uh, 
the late spring of uh, 1940. Um, some of you are familiar with something called the Madagascar plant, right? It, it's not really a plan so much as just an idea. Um, goes back to the late 19th century. Um, some people have suggested Madagascar as a possible solution to the Jewish question, right? Send the Jews there. The, the, the Poles had actually adopted this idea in the 1930s, right, 1937 or so. A, uh, a delegation of Poles had gone to Madagascar with the blessing of the French to see about the, the possibility of sending Polish Jews to Madagascar. And, and the general feeling was there weren't a whole lot of places in Madagascar that um, this would work in, right? I mean, it's a big island, um, long, somewhat desolate, but in terms of food, housing, whatever it was, if it was, it could probably only take a few tens of thousands. Um, but it's something they were looking at. Um, and, and I'll say, by the time the Nazis eventually adopt extermination, it's probably fair to say that that's an idea that had been bouncing around. Um, but it certainly wasn't in the first half of 1940 or, or even up to the first half of 1941, the main idea of bouncing around. And there clearly were uh, other alternatives. Um, interestingly, during the few years after the war's end, um, you know, uh, in the United States, it was found that, in fact, it's pretty easy to get Jews to migrate to a long, desolate island lacking the rudiments of civilization. Um, Prefab housing and freeways and apparently, uh, right, you can fill entire towns with Jews. Um, but, but alas, the Nazis were, were, were not uh, as clever as, uh, as Robert Moses. All right. Um, now, ghettoization serves, however, uh, an important purpose, other than just keeping Jews under wraps. Right? Certainly, you want to keep the Jews isolated. They're dangerous, right, and so forth. But uh, a big part of Hitler's thinking, which I mentioned in an earlier class, was the home front. Right. Um, and it's easy for us to, to get lost in the notion that the Nazis, you know, just did whatever they wanted to do. The fact is, through the war, the Gestapo is spying on Germans, listening in conversations. What do people think about the war? What do people think about what's happening at home front? Because Hitler's takeaway from World War One was that the war was lost on the home front. Right. Hitler would go home on leave during the Great War and be sort of horrified by people complaining about the hunger and complaining about the cold and complaining about all this stuff. Um, and so the, the Nazis very much want the German population during the war to be content. And keeping them content means keeping them fed. And so part of the idea uh, behind ghettoization is an effort to cut down on useless eaters, right? There, there's a pretty simple equation here, right? The more food that goes to Jews and Poles, the less food that's available for the Germans themselves. Um, I, I strongly recommend there's a book um, by a woman named Lizzie Collingham about uh, food policy during World War II, very, very well worth reading. Um, this was, again, hardly an original idea, right? After World War II, um, there were, after World War I, excuse me, there were German writers writing about the question of food and who deserves to be fed and who's a drain on society and so forth. So as a lot of things, the Nazis take other elements of things people have come up with and integrate them into their, um, you know, larger view of things. Um, and the question of useless eaters is what also lays behind another Nazi policy many of you are familiar with that also began, perhaps not coincidentally, in October 1939. Um, and that is the T4 program, um, right, which is the, the Youth in Asia program. And we, we often think of T4 as being about eugenics, right? The Nazis eliminating people from the gene pool who would otherwise pollute the right. And, and, and good reason for that, right? Eugenics is certainly part of this. The Nazis, the United States, Sweden, all of these were world leaders in eugenics. All of them had um, various programs of sterilization and so forth, uh, you know, for people. But in, in the Third Reich, um, and particularly during the war, the eugenics uh, element is existing side by side with an economic component. Right? And, and here you have various bits of propaganda here that highlight that, right? So, I mean, so you can find propaganda that talks about like the impact on the race and population, but the cost, right? How much does it cost to keep 
the mentally ill alive, the disabled alive, right? Who's bearing that burden, right? Um, what can be done with that money, right? Uh, that's better, right? Instead of the, the money it takes to keep this guy alive, you can keep this whole family alive and happy and so forth. So um, worth, worth pointing out here that, um, you know, in, in a number of ways, before we get to extermination, the Nazis certainly are thinking about population control, right? Who gets the resources needed to survive uh, if we want to keep the right German population content? Um, contrary to popular misconception, um, the church protests about T4 didn't end the program, right? So sort of famously, um, you know, in 1940, uh, early 1941, people start getting um, evidence that their family members have uh, been, uh, been, been killed. Um, both the Catholic Church and, and some of the Protestant churches protest about this. Um, those protests slow things down. Um, the centralized facilities are shut down, right? That uh, through the late 40, early 41, you had about half dozen um, uh, gassing sites, right? Where, uh, right, these, these big ones here, where uh, patients were shipped and gassed to death there with carbon monoxide. Those centralized sites were shut down, um, but the murders continue just in, in local hospitals and medical care facilities and nursing homes, um, generally through lethal injections and starvation. Um, so, you know, all this is often held up as a sort of example of the church, right, stepping in and, right, protesting and stopping these murders. It actually just sort of uh, moved in a little more underground and decentralized than it was before. Um, worth pointing out that a lot of the people uh, who are involved in the T4 program are later on going to be transferred uh, east to the uh, Operation Reinhardt facilities in Poland, um, but we're not there yet. So by the beginning of 1941, certainly the treatment of Jews was bad, right? And, you know, all kinds of ways. Again, there, there wasn't one single unified Jewish policy. The treatment of Jews in France is different from Poland, different from Denmark, right? Whatever it may be. Um, uh, but still, no matter how bad it was, still far from genocidal. And, and again, I mentioned this when we talked about Poland a few months ago. You know, in the in the winter of 1940, it's probably fair to say the Germans were killing more Poles than they were Jews, right? I mean, you, you had the arrest of the Polish intelligentsia, Polish priests, army officers, right, whatever it may be. Um, you know, you, you even had, and again, I don't want to make too much of this, um, some Jews who moved from the Russian zone of occupation to the German zone, you had others moving the other direction. But, you know, again, certainly nobody in 1940 was thinking uh, extermination. Um, then 1941 comes along, and by the end of 1941, uh, things have clearly uh, shifted. So what, what, what happened? Um, I'd say that uh, there's not any one answer, but there are four things, all of which take place in 1941, um, which we'll go over uh, in some detail now. One, one is Operation Barbarossa, that's the invasion of the Soviet Union. One are the multiple failures of Operation Barbarossa. Um, one is overcrowding in uh, an area called the Wartegau, which was one of those areas of Poland which were occupied right, by the Germans, uh, integrated into the Reich, I should say. And finally, American entry into the war. Um, so let's look at each of this. So, so number one, understand Barbarossa was different from any previous military campaign of the Germans, right? And, and it, it's worth remembering that, you know, Hitler didn't have to go to war with Britain. Hitler didn't have to go to war with the, the Belgians or the Dutch. Um, even theoretically, France, right, could have worked something out. Um, Poland, he was willing to ally with Poland uh, up until the beginning of 1939 um, against the Soviets. The, the Soviet Union, however, that was the goal, right? Meaning that in, in, in Hitler's view, in the view of a lot of Germans, and again, this was the, the idea of Lebensraum, the idea that Germany's destiny lay in the East and colonization lay in the East, again, was not a Nazi idea. Um, it was an idea that was popular in German expansionist thought into the late, you know, going back to the late 19th century. So in that view of things, the war against the Soviets was going to be different, both in terms of its ends and means. Um, 
This was to be a cataclysmic war of race and ideology. It would decide the fate of, of the Third Reich. It would decide the fate of the German people, right? If Germany was successful, they would knock out their major uh, sort of uh, rival, right, Judeo-Bolshevism. Um, they would gain the land that Hitler envisioned was needed for the expansion of the German people within Europe. Um, the, in their view of things, the Soviet Union uh uh, surrendered, the, the British would also come to terms. Um, so this was going to be a war that knew no limits, right? The Germans, for the most part, right, with, when it came to the British, for example, obeyed the rules of the war, right? They treated prisoners a certain way, right, all this other stuff. None of those rules were going to apply in the Eastern Front. Um, and so right off the bat, right, what, what we're seeing is this sort of ramping up of, of killing. Um, and killing of non-combatants, right? Um, in May 1941, um, this thing called the 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 uh, um, the what is it the Commissar document? Commissar, forget it. Wait, a Commissar order, right? That's a simple enough. Commissar order. Commissar befell. Um, commissar order is given to German troops. In the battle against Bolshevism, the adherence of the enemy to the principles of humanity or international law is not to be counted upon. In particular, it can be expected that those of us who are taken prisoner will be treated with hatred, cruelty, and inhumanity by political commissars of every kind. The troops must be aware that in this battle, mercy or considerations of international law is false. They are a danger to our own safety and to the rapid pacification of the conquered territories. The originators of barbaric Asiatic methods of warfare are the political commissars. Uh, commissars were um, political officers who were attached to the units of the Red Army. So immediate and unhesitating severe measures must be undertaken against them. They are therefore when captured in battle as a routine to be dispatched by firearms. Um, and, it, and it goes on with, 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 with further things about right who gets executed and so forth. So from the start, the, the German military, right, for all their claims about being innocent and honorable and so forth, except they're going to a war where they're going to murder prisoners. And part of the reason for murdering those prisoners is that those prisoners represent this larger system, right? And so if you're going to kill these, these commissars because their role in the system, it's not going to be too much of a jump to say, oh, we need to take other steps to destroy the system as well, right? Important to keep in mind. Um, the Germans are developing in 1941 something called Generalplan Ost, right? The, the general plan for the East, right? Which basically spells out what the goal of this is, right? That they uh, ideally are going to take over, right? This vast territory of essentially the European Russia, right, Ukraine, Belarus, the, the Baltic states, parts of Russia itself. Um, and uh, that's going to become a part of the greater life, right? So it's going to be integrated. That is going to be labor term, living space. German colonists are going to be sent into this territory and given these vast farms, right? So here we have the essence of why this war is so important, right? Because this is Germany's future, right? Um, and in this view of things, of course, you can't have two nations existing as equals in the same space. The question then becomes what happens to the, the population that's already there, right? This whole area is set for German colonization. As for the tens of millions of people living there, 100 plus million people living there, well, some of them will be expelled, right? So there's an idea that they're going to be the expulsion, perhaps, of tens of millions of people into Asiatic Russia, right? Somewhere over here. But also the hunger plan, okay? Um, and this goes again to the issue of useless eaters. The Soviet Union, right, represents this breadbasket. Um, Germany will feed itself by taking food from the captured territories. Um, that serves two purposes. One, it keeps the Germans fed and therefore content, but also 
right? The assumption is it will lead to the mass starvation of tens of millions of Soviets, right? Which will reduce the population there. And then those who survive will become essentially serfs for the German colonists. And to that end, we see uh, things like this, right? You know, unlike in the West where prisoners of war were, you know, again, so the British prisoners treated basically according to the rules of war, French prisoners mistreated, but still fed and so forth. And the Soviet Union, where millions of <coughs> Soviet prisoners, were army soldiers had taken prisoner over the course of that first year, prisoners are just basically placed in these big open air camps um, and allowed to starve to death and die from exposure. Right? It's just good. Young Soviet men dead, that, that, those are men who you don't have to worry about in the future, don't have to feed any of this stuff, right? That, that there is this vast sort of acceptance on the part of German planners that for their victory, right, for, for their plan to be successful, tens of millions of people living in the areas under occupation should die, right? Not just Jews, tens of millions of people. So what all this means is right off the bat, large segments of the population of the occupied USSR are expendable, right? Not only Jews, but certainly Jews, right? So we have a, a sort of a call of Homer here, right? If, if we're in an area, well, let's look at the three places. One, in the context of the commissar order, right? If commissars are dangerous because they're Bolsheviks, and because they motivate the population, and because they serve the needs of Judeo-Bolshevism, and because they could help foment uh, resistance, the same applies to Jews, right? Um, Jews, too, are going to be the population which Bolsheviks are drawn from. The Jews are going to be more likely to become partisans. Jews are more likely to aid partisans. Um, and so you can begin mass killing of Jews in the context of partisan warfare. Um, and in fact, if you look at uh, Bobby Yar, for example, anybody know what, for example, what is, what is Bobby Yar? Anybody know? Bobby Yar was the ravine outside of Kiev, where in two days, 33 or so thousand Jews were killed. Yeah, okay. Um, late September, early October, 1941, the Germans had just taken uh, Kiev. Um, and uh, uh, Bobby R is this ravine outside of the city. Uh, eventually, some 70,000, 100,000 are going to be killed there. But in, in two days, yeah, about 33,000 are killed. That, I mean, do, do you know what precipitated Bobby R other than just wanting to kill Jews? Is the question? Did you know what precipitated the German decision to first begin killing Jews in Bobby R? So the, the KGB, or NKVD at that point, um, before they left Kiev, they had set a bunch of um, time bombs, which had gone off in various places around the city. So uh, after the Germans captured the city, these time bombs go off, and the Germans say, okay, you know what? We're going to teach these people a lesson. We're, they want to attack us and kill us. We're going to kill them, but we're going to punish the Jews because we assume the Jews, if they're not responsible, right, um, they're tied in with the people who are responsible and we'll get rid of them because that'll eliminate a threat. So a lot of the killing begins in this pretext of, right, the Jews are dangerous Bolsheviks, right, or help dangerous Bolsheviks. There's a context of General Plan East, right? Look, if you have a situation where we got to get rid of 30 million people in these, these provinces and without any question, no Jews will be allowed to remain, right? Why not kill them, right? It saves us the trouble of shipping them out later on. Um, you know, we're not going to use them as serfs like the, the Ukrainians or Belarusians, so they can be moved that way. And then, of course, useless eaters, right? Jews who are still alive or Jews that have to be fed, which means less food for Germans. So the, the initial mass killing of Jews in the war in the Soviet Union in 1941 isn't necessarily starting as part of some broader extermination plan for all the Jews of Europe, right? Um, it, it, it's tied in with certain conditions taking place. And then again, that doesn't mean that nobody's talking about extermination. It doesn't mean that nobody's thinking, hey, you know what? This is the easiest, best solution here. But certainly at this point in the summer of 1941, um, th there's no order that's come down 
uh, as is going to happen later on in the year. So the first mass killing of Jews, let's say, begins in the context of the conditions of the Eastern Front and setting up this German colonization area. But it's an interesting thing. It's, it's look, I, I like to read sometimes often in history, and often you deal with World War II. You know, you have this, idea like, oh, the Nazis win, and they complete the final solution. It's a bit counterintuitive. But the fact is, had the Nazis won early enough, right, there might have been no final solution. Um, right, meaning it, it's not inconceivable that that had you know, I mean, Winston Churchill was hit by a cab in New York in the 1930s, um, right across the street in the Upper East Side, got run over. Right, counterfactual: Winston Churchill gets gets killed by a New York cab driver. Um, uh, Lord Halifax becomes prime minister in 1940, signs a, a, a surrender or a treaty with the uh, the Germans, and the Germans, as part of the terms, require the British to take Polish Jews and stick them in Africa somewhere. Maybe what happened. Right. Or 1941, um, uh, Soviet Union collapses, Soviet Union surrenders and the Nazis, right, push tens of millions of people, including, right, millions of Jews somewhere across the Ural Mountains. Right. A lot of them die, let's say, but but no final solution. So it, it, it's, a, it's an interesting thing that had German victory come early enough Um you might have actually avoided the final solution entirely. There's many things would have been good for the Jews, right? Um, but um, things might have ended up very, very different. Um, but that doesn't happen, um, right? The, the, the tremendous successes of the summer and early fall of the Wehrmacht turn into um, disaster by the end of the year. Um, and it's very late in the year, right? I mean, the, 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 the Germans reach the, basically the, the suburbs of Moscow by November. Um, it's not until the first week of, of December that the Soviet counter, that these, by the way, are, are tanks in the Moscow suburbs that are basically being right, driven to the front, um, you know, and you know, actually in some cases built in factories in Moscow and you know, delivered right to the front from the factory gates. Um, so for, for much of the year, the, the Germans are in this sort of another tremendous victories being won, Right, hope that the year will end with the final victory. Um, but some people, perhaps a little more realistic, are starting to think, well, but what if we don't? Right, what if this year ends and um, the Soviet Union is still uh, around, still active? Um, what happens then? So, um, the failures of Barbarossa, right, now leads to new strategic uh, calculations on the part of the uh, of the Germans. Um, and that, that means recalculating a number of things having to do with the, the population in the Soviet Union. Um, for some Soviets, that's going to mean survival, um, right? In the first months, the Soviets, prisoners of war, are just being thrown, as I mentioned, these open air concentration camps, starved to death. By 1942, right? With the full failures of Barbarossa becoming clear, German military planners are starting to think, you know what, maybe we need some of these people, right? That um, there, there may be some use for these prisoners beyond just starving them to death. Um, there are going to be a number of auxiliary units uh, of, of Soviet prisoners of war, um, including as guards in concentration camps. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting when, 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 when the Allies landed in Normandy, uh, parts of Omaha Beach were actually the fortification staffed by um, former Soviet prisoners of war, right? They they put them in in sort of third rate units and figured they were good for garrison duty, you know, on the on the Western Front. But um, yeah, so some for some people this means survival. For others, though, it's going to mean uh, new means of murder um, uh, and new scale of murder. Um, one concern the Germans are starting to have is the impact of these mass killings on their own personnel. Um, some people are fine with it. Uh, a lot of people are not. And, you know, again, part of the German military's, you know, mythology is, oh, well, the, the Wehrmacht, right, we didn't touch this, right? The, everybody, the Wehrmacht did it. Police units did it. Waffen-SS did it, right? Auxiliary units did it. All these different units were involved in some way. 
And again, that meant that these were being seen by people. It meant that they were um, being participated by people, and some of those people couldn't cope with it. Um, so to that end, um, by autumn 1941, experiments are being conducted with other means of mass killing. Um, some involving mass explosives, right? Putting a bunch of people in a ditch and setting up explosives. That was not particularly uh, pleasant for the people either. Um, uh, but gas vans, um, which had been used in T4 as well, right? Basically, you take big panel trucks, you drive them around um, with, uh, with the... Uh, What's going on? Uh, somebody could mute themselves there, perhaps. Big gas vans, drive them around and... Uh, uh, you know, at first you would just have like a canister of carbon oh, monoxide as yeah, four yeah, used. Um, but uh, in the Eastern Front, they begin to try and come up with more efficient ways. Um, uh, and what they eventually come up with is, of course, leading the exhaust pipes directly into the bed of the truck um, so it powers itself. Um, uh, it's also in the autumn of. Uh, late September, early October, 1941, that experiments are conducted with gassings uh, using Zyklon B in Auschwitz. Um, so, so somebody's uh, sound is on, maybe if they could do something about that um, or not. Okay. Um, right, Zyklon B in Auschwitz. The original idea was not to gas Jews. Right. So again, in keeping with, I think, the, the, the changing concerns about the Soviet prisoners, there's this thought, OK, look, we've got so many prisoners. Some of them are dangerous, um, you know, maybe politically dangerous. Maybe they're going to be leading people in uprisings. We don't want to shoot these people in front of the other prisoners because that's obviously problematic. Maybe we can truck them off somewhere and gas them. And so the initial uh, gassing experiments at Auschwitz were done with uh, Soviet prisoners of war to see, right, proof of concept, right? Can we do this, right? Is this an effective way of killing people? Uh, so already by October 1941, you've got a whole bunch of elements that are coming together. Um, another element takes place in the Vartigo. And if you look at this map here, Right. This is the Vartigo. A Gao is like a province. Um, so this is one of these areas that had been Polish. The Germans integrate it, and it's full of Jews and Poles. And uh, Arthur Greiser, who's the Gao leader, right, the guy in charge, is confronted by a dilemma in the end of 1941. He's supposed to be kicking Jews into the general government. But the people in the general government are saying, we've got too many Jews already, right? Hans Frank, who's in charge of the GG, is saying, we, we can't take any more Jews. Our ghettos are full, um, right? This has got to stop. Um, so in the Vartigo, Greiser is feeling, okay, I've got to get rid of these Jews. More Jews are coming in because what the, the German government is doing is taking Jews from other parts of Germany and shipping them into the Vartigo. And so... Um, he asked for authorization to begin implementing gassings using vans. So it's an interesting thing. Again, this, he's not ordered to do this, right? This isn't a, an order that's coming from high up there. There's not at this point any sort of, uh, as they say, Fuhrer befell, a Fuhrer order saying, begin gassing the Jews. This begins uh, as essentially a local initiative to resolve a specific problem, right? Overpopulation of Jews in the bar to go. Um, but it's not unreasonable to conclude that somebody is paying attention to this stuff, right? Um, which brings us to the last element in this, which is uh, adding the central planning and coordination, right? So look, by November, let's say, you've got the idea that Jews are expendable um, and we've killed a million of them already, right? They're whatever the number is, by shooting in the Eastern Front, uh, nobody seems to care. And nobody cares about killing Soviet POWs either, right? I mean, uh, keep in mind, I want to make this clear, by November, right, huge numbers of Soviet citizens have been murdered, starved to death, um, right, all of this stuff, um, without any apparent hindrance, right, to Germany. Um, Got to raise some questions. In late November, a meeting was called for December 9th to discuss the final solution of the Jewish question, right? 
Um, and there are those who argue that by that point already, um, extermination had already been adopted. Don't really know, right? Uh, might have been, might not have been. But what we do know is that before uh, that meeting took place, two things happened. One, the Soviet counteroffensive uh, saved Moscow and drives the German army back, raising questions about how long that war in the Eastern Front is going to take and if it can be one. And the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Um, and there is, there is a theory on some pretty good historians that one of the things that was part of the calculus of the Nazis was the American response. Right. That, uh, and this view of things, you know, the, and again, it's, this may seem absurd to us, but again, in the Nazi mindset, the Jews have this tremendous influence in the halls of power that keeping the Jews alive was a means of holding on a collateral. Right. Um, we've got millions of Jews under our control. That's going to keep the Americans right behaving. Well, the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. And, uh, you know, a day later, the U.S. declares war on Japan. And three days after that, Germany declares war on the United States. And um, there's no reason, theoretically, then to play nice with the Jews anymore because we're already at war with America. Um, this conference, which we know as the Vance Conference, uh, is rescheduled um, and takes place on January 20th, 1942. And it... Uh, it, it's important to keep in mind, basically, we talked about that. Look, by this point, with the, the, the Soviet victory in um, Moscow, the idea of expelling the Jews past the Urals isn't really an option anymore, right? Uh, not anytime soon, right? The Soviets don't seem to be giving up. The idea of holding them as collateral against the British or against the Americans no longer seems relevant anymore. So what do we do with them? And all the same things that had been true at the beginning of the war are still, are still there, right? They're dangerous. They hate us. They're useless eaters. Um, and we can add to that, as the war goes worse and worse, a revenge motive, right? Okay, well, this is where we can look at some of the things that the Germans have said and Hitler said before. And when they were saying, oh, we're going to make the Jews pay for this, well, maybe in 1939, when Hitler said, we'll make the Jews pay, he didn't mean extermination. But by 1943... Right. Well, you know what? Uh, maybe we're really going to make them pay. And to clarify, the, 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 the Vance Conference is not where the final solution was planned. Right. It's already decided. And again, we don't know who or how or when. Generally, again, sometime in the last months of 1941. So was it something decided on in December? Maybe. But if it was, it was probably something that at least had been talked about beforehand. Uh, we don't know who came up with it, right? So unlike the intentionalists for whom Hitler was central to this, this could have easily been a subordinate. Um, you know, to, to be glib about it, you could have had a meeting on Friday where somebody said, okay, um, the, or, you know, the, the, the Germans, you know, the, the, let's, say on Sunday, let's say on Sunday, somebody says the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, um, what are we going to do with the Jews? Now everybody come back on Wednesday with three ideas. Um, and one of them was extermination. Um, here is the, the highly euphemistic language of the Vance Conference. What's interesting is even in the euphemistic language, the, the, the full shape of this is pretty obvious. So the Vance Conference talks about background, right? What's, what's happening with the Jewish question up until this point, right? What other solutions have been proposed? It talks about where the Jews are now, right? Numbers. It talks about the difficulties they've had with some allies, right? We, we tried to get the Hungarians on board, they say no. We tried to get the Italians, they say no, whatever it may be. But here's what it proposes as the final solution. Under proper guidance in the course of the final solution, the Jews are to be allocated for appropriate labor in the East. Able-bodied Jews separated according to sex will be taken in large work columns to these areas for work on roads, in the course of which action, doubtless, a large portion will be limited by natural causes. The possible final remnant will, since it will undoubtedly consist of the most resistant portion, has to be treated accordingly because it is the product of natural selection and would have released act as the seed of a new Jewish revival. So here's what's fascinating, right? This is supposed to be euphemistic, but if you read into this, it's pretty clear that even with the euphemism, all the Jews are supposed to die, right? What does it say here? 
able-bodied Jews will be sent to work in the East. Okay, well, what's going to happen to the non-able-bodied Jews? But are we going to assume that the, the Germans will be feeding and caring for and operating nurseries for the women and children? Right? Uh, pretty unlikely. So one assumes that those unable to work will have to die. What about the ones who are able to work? Well, they'll go and they'll be worked to death. Right? And the ones who survive? Well, those will be the toughest ones and those you have to kill anyway. So it's fascinating in terms of those uh, again, sort of a Holocaust deniers to argue that, oh, no, this, this isn't about killing Jews. This is about working them, right? Even in the euphemism, right, it's pretty clear that the end result is the extermination of the Jews. And as Eichmann himself put it later on, how shall I put it? Certain overplaying talk and jargon expressions had to be rendered into office language by me, right? And, and look, we have the wonderful situation here where Eichmann, who was the assistant to Reinhard Heydrich, who was in charge of the meeting, um, and implementing the final solution, served as secretary at the meeting. He testified in Jerusalem. He talked about in interviews with William Sasson, who was a, a German Dutch journalist, Nazi journalist, who interviewed him before he was kidnapped by the Israelis. Um, so we know what was discussed there, but we still don't really know uh, exactly when this stuff took place. It's, it's, it's pretty reasonable to conclude that discussions and ideas regarding extermination were talked about over the course of 1941. Um, but that, that it's really probably in the, uh, the autumn slash early winter of 1941, or let's say autumn of 1941, that all of the pieces are actually in place, right? Um, you have a, a, a Third Reich, which certainly at that point has no um, uh, moral issue with mass murdering large numbers of people, and right? certainly not Jews. Um, you have... Uh, a sense that the continued existence of Jews poses a threat, whether it's a direct threat because they're so sinister or a, a, a more abstract threat as useless eaters. You have the, the tools that are available now. They've developed both stationary and mobile gas and systems. Um, and you, you have really sort of no reason to keep them alive anymore because any sort of uh, benefit there might have been to not killing the Jews is gone when the American entered into the war. Um, and so, you know, whether it was decided on before December or in December, at some point probably in the end of the year, uh, that's when it happens. Um, and, and to that, and I would say, therefore, that um, the, the, the functionalist view of um, the final solution, that this wasn't, you know, planned for 20 years. This wasn't the Nazis idea from the beginning, uh, but rather it's, it's more an outgrowth of all of these. It, it's, it's Nazi ideology that, that from beforehand, but it, it's also a variety of things that take place during the war itself. And had things gone a little differently, right? In fact, had things gone better for the Germans, um, right? The, the result for the Jews might've been very, very different. Uh, and with that, I throw it open for anybody who has questions, concerns, comments. Uh, do I do? <laughs> um, from the little knowledge that I have, yeah. I would say cr the chronology is important here also. I think that in 1941, yes, there was a critical moment in June when the Nazis invaded the Soviet Union or so Soviet Poland. But their plan not only was to, to destroy the Soviet Union, as we the European Soviet Union, but it was also to kill every Jew along the way. The Einsatzgruppen came in right behind the military and their, their function was not to play nice. Their function was to kill a million Jews before, before the end of 1941. And that was, that was how they were showing their there. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. But again, I want to point out there's a difference between uh, our plan is to kill a million Jews in the Soviet Union in this particular area, right, versus we are going to set up a network to ship all the Jews in Europe to extermination. Right? Yes, I, mean, I think that, yes, you're absolutely right. But I just, I want to finish the point because yeah. the chronology also is by December of 41, before the Vansi conference even, 
Helmna was already in place. Helmna yeah, sorry, you're right. I didn't make that clear. Arthur Greiser, right. <laughs> that's, I, I thought that's one of the things we're like, oh, I know what this means. When, when I when I talk about the Vartigo, that's Helmna. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Correct. Those Jews that were, let's say, in Lodge, in that area, yeah. they, were the, they, they were shipped just a few miles to Helmna. And that was the first extermination camp that that was established in 41. Right, but again, the point is that it was an extermination camp that was established in a local initiative, right, as opposed to somebody saying, our plan is to exterminate all the Jews. It was Arthur Greiser saying, I've got to solve this problem here. So yes. flash forward a couple of weeks and somebody's going to say, hey, We've got we've got Greiser doing great work there. We've got Rudolf Hess doing great work in Auschwitz, right? What can we do here? So yeah, right. The exterminate, right? Gas and Jews is already in place, but again, it wasn't uh, a top-down order for all the Jews. It was yeah, right. So maybe I didn't make it great. Yeah, all, all everything you're saying is absolutely correct, right? Uh, that that ultimately this all sort of blends together into right the final solution, um, and it's quite reasonable it's to lump it. Yes, yeah, correct. And it is two yeah. stages. It's emigration, it's ghettoization, it's brutality, it's starvation, it's then Einsatz group and you know mass murder. Yeah. That can't that can't be sustained. It's just too bloody and, and up close. And then it has to be more uh, inform you know impersonal mass right. murder in in gas chambers. Yeah, right. And and of course mass murder in places where. Jews in places where you can't just go around killing them because it's France and Belgium. And yes, that the West was a whole other policy. Yeah. So, David, my que my statement and question is: since I'm probably the oldest participant tonight, I why are you smart? <laughs> <laughs> that may be true, the oldest but... participant. You're to fight about that I took you off the hook. I took you off the hook. I understand it. Since I'm probably the oldest participant tonight, and I'll also point out that I'm fourth generation um, European Jew to live in America, uh, but I still have some memory of how World War II was discussed in my house, and certainly the aftermath of the war. The war itself is very remote, but the aftermath is not so remote. So um, I do have... Um, a few questions, and I also, but I have to preface that by also saying thank you for helping me to expand um, my understanding of what was happening in Germany and in Europe and with Jews. But you did mention something about, and I have other questions, but I, I can email you. Um, you did mention something about um, the war and the Holocaust. Now, I think it's Lucy Davidovich or maybe others who said that if Hitler would not have perseverated on killing the Jews, he perhaps could have won the war. And so he took away so many resources from his own military and, and, and uh, misdirected them. So is there any, what, what's your feeling on that? Well, look, I mean, <laughs> You're getting into sort of a micro level in terms of the, the kind of or certainly, um, you know, you have evidence that in 1943, you know, trains and things that would have been better sir, better suited to providing supplies on the Eastern Front are being used to ship Jews right to Treblinka. Um, but but that said, the 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 you know basic math of the war was lack of oil and people and resource like meaning that that whether the war had gone on another month I, I, the, 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 the the issue the, the, the far greater issue for Germany was its its lack of oil and uh, you know industry and these other things um, certainly didn't help them at all to be um, using these resources for the Jews um, but it, you know that that I would say was not the the make or break thing that they had going for them can I ask you something else? You yeah. mentioned about food shortage. So, yeah. you know, so if you starve, if you starve people, then there's more food. But what about the Nazi, the Nazi um, incentive, or at least among some of them, to provide slave labor? Yeah. Well, so 
look, you, you hit on something important here, right? We have this tendency to view the Third Reich as this incredibly centralized, top-down structure. The fact is, there are lots of conflicting and, and dueling um, goals. Um, and even when you look at like the Eastern Front, you know, th there there's different administrative units. There's military concern. There's SS concern, right? So they want to provide slave labor. Well, slave slave labor um, is generally pretty cheap. Um, you don't have to feed them too much, right? Yeah. One of the advantages. Uh, slave labor, um, but you, you get into these problems. Right? The fact is, there are going to be places in the Third Reich where they need to feed their slave laborers more because the slave laborers are doing work that you know requires you know more intricacy or something like that. Um, for keep in mind though, too, people's perception of hunger varies, right? So, um, if I'm a slave laborer in Germany, right. To the German supervisor, I, I'm, I'm going hungry. In comparison to my family back in Ukraine, um, I'm doing much better, right? So um, the, the, the question is, Beth, we're going to starve X number of people to death. We're going to keep X number of people alive to work for us. Um, and at the end of the day, we will have enough people who are alive working for us um, to uh, to to do the job, and if these slave laborers die from hunger, there's always more, right? Because there's no shortage of people in Ukraine and France and Poland who are desperate for for work and food. So um, there there is a uh, there, there's no easy formula for how much you know you, you do any of this stuff. But yeah, there's there's no contradiction there, right? We 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 need work done. We'll feed them more than the people. Because remember, the, the question is useless eaters. A slave laborer is not a useless eater. He's, you know, actually a fairly useful eater. Anyone else? Oh, I know, I know you, you've got the look of those students who are like, okay, the teacher's done talking. If nobody asks us any questions, then class is done. Barry, you're muted. How do you reconcile? Uh, Barry, when I said Barry, when I said you're muted, I wasn't condemning you. I was simply pointing out. Well, that... Okay, so I'll email you. I have other questions. I'll email you. Okay, that's it. You want to ask a question? I'm I'm here. You can ask. I'm okay. Good. So, so I have a question. So how do yeah. you reconcile the by night by the early 1943 Stalingrad was had fallen. Yeah. It was, and everything was being pushed back from early 43, but with with the war really. Anyone who had put a bed on it was the Americans were in the war. They were on the, you know, they were making their way through North Africa, and, the, and also they had landed already in, uh, well, in another few months they're going to land in uh, Normandy. But in any case, there's a, there are many multiple fronts. They're losing their major battle with the, with the Russians, and yet they were maniacally driven. To, to to exterminate 750,000, 800,000 Hungarian Jews when resources were totally strained, where everything was collapsing by that time. But nevertheless, that was to their very end and to the very yeah. end. That was the, that was the, the mania that that, that they Yeah, they, so so yeah, with, with no question, look, however let me let me put this however they got to the final solution, once they were in, they were all in, right? So right, whether whether they planned it in 1922 or 1942, right? Um, it, it was a mania. It's a good word, right? I mean, the, the fact is they they came to see it. Look. It's important to note here, and this is one of the reasons why the Germans lose the war, is Hitler, for all of his right self-professed military genius and his understanding and, and of, of the minutiae of the German war machine, he viewed the conflict as part of this larger um, clash of race and civilization, yes. right? I mean, so so you know, for him and for a whole lot of people working for him, if you lose, look, you lose the war, okay? But if in the course of losing the war, you have eliminated the Jewish question from Europe, right, then, then maybe somewhere down the road, right, you rise from the ashes, or maybe at the very least, right, you, you've won a small victory, 
or a big victory, right? You get something out of it. So, you know, yeah, no, it, but it's, it's, it's not right. It's, it's logical in, this, in, in their view though. Right. I mean, so to us, it seems like a mania, but as with, with any sort of insanity, um, if you accept the founding premise, right, right. Then everything makes perfect sense. If the Jews are all the things that the Nazis said they were, then their actions follow a logic. Okay. You know, thank you for that, because that, that was a question that I was going to go back to Hitler's role and his, uh, uh, you know, uh, he, how he persists in killing Jews. But I have, I have another question. Yeah. Wasn't there, if I remember correctly, a revolt by German generals? So uh, July 20th, uh, 1944, you have the assassination attempt um, uh, by Hitler. Uh, yeah, yes. But it was, it was, keep in mind, it was not a, you know, look, after the fact, all these people are trying to, you know, cast themselves as, you know, great moral lights and so forth. For, for most of them, their, their issues were not, uh, Stauffenberg had some, some there, there, there was a small core among the, the German aristocracy um, uh, that had developed uh, strong religious and moral objections. For a lot of these generals, though, their objections weren't to any of the atrocities the Germans were committing. Their objections were to the fact that Hitler was losing the war. <laughs> I mean, their, their goal was simply to work out something, to work at the best possible solution. So maybe if we kill Hitler, then we can negotiate with the allies in the West and hold on to some territories in the East and, and come up with something. So afterwards again anybody who survived it went through great efforts to present themselves as you know the, the moral opposition to hitler for most then there was no question of morality it was just a matter of pragmatics yeah. okay and if no one else has something to ask i have one more question yeah. i read something um i i don't know if it was last week or two weeks ago uh there was a review in the times about a uh, a book and they talk about the rat line yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a after after World War II, there were various uh, systems in place to get. Uh, I assume you're talking about uh, things like uh, you know Odessa and so forth that got Germans to, to to their Latin American vias. Is that is that what we're talking about? Yeah. So you had already a very large German population in South America. You had in a number of those countries governments which had been uh, very friendly to the Third Reich uh, until things went bad, um, and uh, you know you had uh, therefore efforts made to smuggle sometimes with the collusion of the church um, and, and important church officials uh, Germans into Latin America. Um, you know you also had obviously things like the United States and you know, Operation Paperclip that you know sort of um, provided new uh, you know, protection for Germans uh, who were of some use to us scientifically or merit militarily, right? I mean, you know, NASA was, you know, obviously a bunch of, uh, you know, German scientists and so forth. So there are, there are all, all kinds of ways for, uh, for, for Germans to work, to work out, old Nazis to work out all right after the, uh, after the war. So that rat line was really from, from Germany to Genoa, generally, and then across to uh, Argentina. That's how Eichmann escaped. And he was given sanctuary in monasteries. And the Red Cross was very willing to issue um, visas in anyone's name because there were so many, so many displaced persons in that time. They, they didn't check. Um, they weren't working with the allies to check if he was a war criminal in any way. And there were people in the Vatican who were high up in the Vatican who were so anti-communist, who believed that helping the helping the Germans, you know, who that was that was actually a mitzvah for them. And then there was Perón, who was a fascist and and accepted these Germans and wanted to build up Argentina, and also Paraguay and Brazil. All of these countries, they were you know military fascists. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, then, then with that, I, I think that in a, in, a, in, a, in a few weeks or so, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, maybe in a few months, I'll do a series on, uh, on, on Jews and organized crime, both in Europe and America. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll give that all. So I have nice... no questions. I have no questions. I know we're... 
<laughs> Are you going to talk about the Jews in Detroit, the Purple Gang? I'll, I'll talk about the Purple Gang. I'll, I'm reading a book right now about Jewish criminals in Chicago. I'll do it all. I, a broad I, I don't know anything about that. Nothing. I'm, listen, Stan, I, Stan Barry, Barry will be interviewed from his cell. <laughs>